The term bushranger evokes images of the colourful wild colonial period, of men on horseback holding up coaches coming from the goldfields and escaping with fortunes in the precious metal, of chases through the bush by posses of troopers and locals and fleeing to hidden caves for refuge. Originally a bushranger was an escaped convict from one of the penal settlements in Australia who hid in the bush and ranged about trying to survive and avoid recapture. The first documented use is in 1805, although the first bushranger is now usually said to have been John Caesar, an African convict who was shot in 1796. By the 1820s the term meant the same as highwayman in England or an outlaw in the American West. The heyday of bushranging was the 19th century, particularly the 1820s when escaped convicts like Bold Jack Donoghue, Matthew Brady and Michael Howell rode and in the 1850s and 1860s, when native-born Australians like Ben Hall and Captain Thunderbolt sought easy riches during the gold rush era. The bushranging era is generally said to have ended with the most famous of them all, the Kelly Gang, in 1880, following the gun battle with police at Glen Rowan. Even then, the Kenneth brothers were still causing trouble until 1902 and were classed as bushrangers. Patrick Kenneth was hanged for murder in 1903. Some of the most popular of early Australian films were bushranger related. The Salvation Army made a film in 1904 called Bushranging in North Queensland. The very first feature length film ever made was an Australian bushranging film, The Story of the Kelly Gang, which premiered on the 26th of December 1906. It was based on stage plays about bushrangers which were popular with audiences at the time. 116 bushranger themed films are documented to be made in Australia between 1900 and 1914. A ban in some Victorian towns in 1907 foreshadowed other legal restraint against the genre from 1911. Bans on bushranging films due to them glamorising crime were enacted in New South Wales the ban remained until 1942. So popular were bushranger movies that after 1911, production of Australian films, which had been amongst the highest in the world, declined sharply. It was just the first legislative move made by politicians that destroyed the industry in Australia for decades. The Kelly Gang made in 1920 avoided the prohibition by opening with a warning about breaking the law. When the Kellys were out, made in 1923, was not so fortunate and banned in New South Wales. When the Kellys Road similarly was banned in New South Wales from 1934 until 1942. There were bandits who were deemed to be bushrangers in the newspapers by virtue of the fact that they hid out in the wild, having committed some act, usually theft, or committed crimes there, but it had become a quaint term. Urban underworld figures had replaced these rural criminals in the public mind. Gangsters like Squizzy Taylor, Harold Tarlington and Sid Kelly. However, in March 1922, 15-year-old Henry Alexander Maple became known as the Boy Bushranger. He grew up at Nerham, Gippsland, Victoria, on the family farm. Although his father was a big man, as Henry grew, he found himself unable to control his son. Henry was sent to Royal Park Children's Home, and then in 1920 he was boarded out with a family at Thorpedale. Mabel was six foot tall, but gangly with large feet, and physically slow. He was nicknamed Draft Horse because of it. At the children's home he proved too clumsy and lethargic to be a capable boxer, but he was a crack shot. He made friends with another boy, an 18 year old called Robert Banks, at Thorpedale. He had Banks hold a cigarette holder between his fingers and shot them out from 30 yards away, and could shoot a spitting half penny out of the air from 10 yards away. The youthful bushrangers raided local farms of anything they could steal, robbed the Nerham post office and Bloomfield co-op stores. From the latter, Maple took a pea rifle and some ammunition. His next act was to fire 10 shots in revenge at a homestead where a woman and four children were sheltering. He believed they had found and taken some stolen property he had hidden in thick fern nearby, which had in fact been discovered by police. 
This escalation brought a large search party out to capture the pair. By the 25th of March, 40 police assisted by 90 civilians were searching for the teenagers. A party of four located their camp, and Constable Bartels ordered both to put their hands up. Laughing, Maple raised his rifle and shot a hole through the policeman's hat. The policeman fired back and cut the cigarette in Maple's mouth in half. The pursuers believed they had the boys pinned down and waited for reinforcements. When they edged forward, they realised the boys had managed to sneak away unseen. Banks had hidden his gun when surprised by 21-year-old George Wollstonecroft, a returned soldier and now storekeeper, who handed over his prisoner to police. Maple, meanwhile, had appeared on a farm and was fired at by a milker with a shotgun. As he fled, he ran into a horseman on the road. Again, it was George Wollstonecroft who fired at him. Maple crouched down behind a fallen tree and returned fire, smashing the stock of the rider's weapon, the bullet deflecting into the man's arm. Despite the wound bleeding freely, he pulled out a revolver, so Maple fired again through the man's shoulder, seriously injuring him. Wollstonecroft rode for safety, falling from his horse. Although a nurse who lived nearby was quickly on scene to assist, it was believed the man would die. The boy ran off, but the posse was beating the ferns in a line and closing in. A group of fifteen searchers found him in a clump of fern, and he was called on again to surrender. In reply, he fired two shots at them before his gun jammed. He turned to run and was shot down, a bullet catching him between the eyes. Taken to hospital, he died half an hour later. Banks was sent to Castlemaine Prison. Wollstonecroft survived, but on the 1st of February 1937, he went fishing in a local creek, slipped and hit his head on rocks. He broke his neck and was found a half an hour later lying in six inches of water. He was 35 years old and the father of three children. The community was somewhat distressed that a youngster was hunted down and shot, and there were real concerns that Ernest Clifford Hull, a 17-year-old who robbed the pay clerk at Clune's knitting mill of £186 at gunpoint, would be dealt with similarly. Hull had worked at the mill and was brooding about getting dismissed and fired a shot as he departed. He paused to steal a watch from a shop during his getaway. After leaving the mill, he stopped a woodcarter named Daniel Thompson on the Talbot Road and asked him to take a letter to the Mayor of Clunes for him. It read, To the public in Clunes, Women, girls and children will not be harmed by me. The same applies to unarmed men who do not hinder me in my progress. Signed, Hull, Bushranger. Two days later, he was asleep in a hammock in an abandoned shed when two policemen and his cousin, Richard Hull, found him and 68 pounds of the loot hidden under a loose floorboard in a tobacco tin. Detective Hingston wielded a torch while Constable Rainey went in first and pinioned the lad while Richard Hull secured the rifle. The mill owner rewarded Hingston with a gold medal. The other two got nothing, and were said to be piqued. Hull was sent to prison for robbery under arms. Clifford Hull died in 1981, at the age of 76. Meanwhile in South Australia, having read of the antics of Maple and the Kelly Gang, in July following an argument with his father, a 14-year-old Willunga boy named Norman Wilfred Baker left a note saying he was going to have a short life and a merry one using a quote by the 18th century Welsh pirate Bartholomew Roberts, often associated with Australian bushrangers, who shared a similar outlook on life. Then he stole two rifles and set out on his brief career as a bushranger. Donning a handkerchief mask, the boy who was five foot six and with a good physique, jumped out from behind a tree and levelled a Winchester rifle at a local farmer named Frederick de Coe, whom he bailed up with the threat that he would blow his brains out. You know what I want, he said. Turn out your pockets. I want your knife and your money. He then relieved his victim of one pound eight shillings in coins, but handed him back a one pound note that was also in the man's purse. He took off into the bush, heading south toward Mount Compass, where a search ensued which lost track of him. He had actually turned north and went to Kangarilla, where he stole a blanket and some provisions from a labourer's hut. By Friday he was exhausted and hungry, so he returned home after a few days. 
His father immediately called police, who unceremoniously dragged the sleeping boy from his bed and arrested him, despite prior statements that they would never take him alive. Sent to the McGill Reformatory to await trial, he was not the slightest bit remorseful, but indicated he intended to return to bushranging once he was able. In September 1922, Baker was sentenced to be held at the reformatory until he turned 18, but in true desperado style, the boy bushranger escaped on the afternoon of the 11th of March 1923 and made his way to Strathalbyn, 27 miles away, by Wednesday, where he was arrested. He had lived off fruit taken from orchards and managed to sneak into his father's house at Wollonga and stole three knives. He was returned to the reformatory and apparently gave up the life of a bushranger. He died in his 91st year in 1998. Jack Bradshaw claimed to be the last of the bushrangers. He had served time for a robbery, so maybe he could claim he was a bushranger. He and a companion named John Mulholland, alias Lovely Riley, stuck up the bank at Quirindi in 1880. He said he ran a foot race still armed with a gun and carrying the loot on him in a nearby town in the presence of five policemen prior to his capture. Both men got 12 years jail for stealing £5,000. Riley claimed he hid his share in Queensland before his capture and managed to spend it after finishing his sentence. Bradshaw, a poet and author, claimed that he had personally met Captain Thunderbolt, Ben Hall, Frank Gardner, Mad Dog Morgan, the Kelly Gang and others. Well, they spiced up the books he wrote, but how much was true, nobody can say. He died on the 14th of January 1937, aged 90. Perhaps the title for the last bushranger should go to Alan Tawney, who, like Henry Maple, terrorised Gippsland in Victoria. A 15-year-old girl named Isabel Williams was menaced by a 5 foot 5 tall armed man who broke into her home and pointed his rifle at her on the 23rd of September 1940 on a farm a few miles from Tumbarumba, New South Wales. He told her, if you know my language, get. Isabel ran to get her father and the man fled. An hour later and three miles away, he also told a rabbit trapper, Maurice Garvin, who he encountered, to get when Garvin made a remark about the rifle. 30 police and 15 bushmen were sent out on the man's trail. The search concentrated on Jingelic and Tuma, as it was thought he would head for the Victorian border. On the 26th of September 1940, the armed man was identified as 29-year-old Alan Tawney, who had escaped the Kenmore Mental Asylum near Goulburn, when a waistcoat stamped G5 was located on the man's trail. G5 showed it to be made at Goulburn Jail for supply to Kenmore. The search around Tumbarumba failed to find him, and by October it was believed he had escaped to Victoria, where he had two sisters and a brother living. He was tentatively identified as the man who held up two soldiers with a knife near Bendigo, and then two civilians later. Tawney took to the bush in Gippsland in the Butcher's Ridge area, occasionally raiding properties for supplies, for a month. On the 12th of December he held up William Sedan at Martins Creek, and robbed him of binoculars and other effects. On the 16th of December, he held up two women near Sardine Creek and stole food. A 17-year-old youth who observed what was happening fired at Tawney, who ran off but then stopped and fired at the two women as they stood in front of their hut, just missing one of them. The youth fired a volley of shots and drove Tawney off. It wasn't until the 20th of December 1940 that heavy rain gave away his location. Early in the morning, smoke was noticed coming from his concealed camp at Sardine Creek by three forestry workers, and police were summoned. Tawney was defiant when called on to surrender, until a bullet was fired over his head. When arrested, he was found to have powder burns and a gunshot wound on his face, and a bullet hole in his shoulder. He had attempted suicide two nights earlier, after the incident where he shot at the young women, he explained. After 39 days in the bush, he was ill, weak and dejected. He was sunburned and his clothes tattered. He had slept in hollow logs with saplings covered by an oil skin as a mattress and a tarpaulin for cover from the elements. Three loaded rifles were found on a tree stump. His odyssey had taken him 600 miles and earned him the name the Snowy River Bandit. Taken to court on the 2nd of January 1941, 
Tawny was charged with intent to murder Jean May and Louisa Godber, three counts of breaking and entering and stealing food, clothing and money. Following treatment for his physical wounds, Tawny was examined by psychiatrists and deemed to be insane. Charges were withdrawn and he was sent to Ararat Mental Hospital to be kept under medical supervision. Tawny escaped from Ararat on the 18th of July 1943. The following day he was sighted at Barclay. A couple of days later he arrived at an aunt's house at St Arno. He ate a meal and told his aunt he intended to visit his mother at Avoca and then return to the hospital. That evening, a shotgun and 44 cartridges were stolen from a car in St. Arno, which Tawny was assumed to have taken. On the 30th of July, he was surprised early in the morning while asleep in an old hut in heavily timbered bush at Warrenmang in the Glenlofty Ranges, between Avoca and Ararat, by police searchers. He was unarmed and gave no trouble. It was decided that Tawny had suffered dementia praecox and several small bouts of depression. He seemed happiest when employed, which made him capable of supporting himself in society. He was released in October 1943, and apparently lived a quiet life. By the 1950s, the mythologising of the old bushranger days was being completed. There was no room for new legends amongst the recollections of centenarians and nonagenarians, of fleeting encounters with daring old-time bushrangers. When 97-year-old Elizabeth Marshall passed away in 1951, it was mentioned that when a young woman, she had danced with Captain Thunderbolt. Virginia Ebden had her own story when she turned 94 in 1950. She had sat on the lap of Martin Cash when she was seven, who assured her he would not hurt a sweet little girl like her. Also in 1951, 90-year-old Addie Richards spoke of meeting Scotty the Bushranger when she was a child at her father's boot-making shop. Scotty had always seemed like a gentleman, despite being John Healy, a bushranger alleged to have killed more than once. Catherine Woodland, on her 100th birthday in 1950, recounted the time she was held up with other passengers by Ben Hall, 85 years earlier. Incidentally, a rusty muzzle-loading revolver discovered in 1952 was said to have once belonged to Ben Hall. It was thought to be a Holof brand gun, given to a friend of Hall's whose son was given it as a toy. The grandson of the original recipient found it in a dam after it was missing for many years. Bushrangers existed now only in memories, romances and the dark corners of history. <laughs>